to Calvary. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, if you're visiting or maybe you're here for the very first time, we are just uh, excited that you've come to worship with us. Uh, we have been going through the gospel of John, the life of Jesus. Next week, we'll pick up where we left off. We're in chapter 13, so I encourage you to read ahead. T this morning, we have a guest speaker with us. Uh, we've um, invited Wes Bentley to come and share what's going on on the mission field. So let, let me just say this before we get started, guys. Um, Wes is going to be very candid about what he's experienced um, on the mission field in Sudan and in other, other regions. Now, if you have kids with you and they're in the sanctuary this morning or even out in the foyer, he's going to describe some things that might be a little hard to hear. And um, especially for, for children. Uh, so I've asked our children's ministry, if you, you know, you're thinking, uh, what, what, this isn't going to be PG. He's, he's going to just say it like it is. And I've asked him to um, just say it like it is. This, this is, we need to, as a church, as a, as a Christian community, to understand that there's a war going on. And it's, it's for real. It's not, it's not something in fantasy land. It's not on, on you know, the television set. This is what's going on right now in our world. And so um, if you have children and you're going, I don't know if I want them to hear, please, they're open. We ask them to stay open. Make your way over there. And we understand, you know, you, you walk back in whenever you get them checked in. So just, I want to give you that warning. I had a, a gentleman at first service who was a little shook up because he had his little girl with him. And I said, you know, we, I warned you guys, don't, um, don't, don't, don't say I didn't warn you. So uh, I'm warning you now. He, he's, he's going he's gonna to say some things that might be a little bit hard to swallow um, for all of us. And I, I think it's hard. I think it's important that we as the church get that perspective. And so um, I, we, we, we've, been studying and one of the things I've kind of shared with you guys the last couple of weeks kind of our mission for I think it's our mission as 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 Christians but I think our mission for 2021 I, I, I kind of shared was was the Great Commission that we're here to make disciples and 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 disciples are to make disciples and one of those the command was to make disciples in all the nations and uh and 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 um Ben is doing exactly that. And so would you give Wes Bentley a, a, a warm Calvary Chapel Rio Grand Valley welcome? We'll see how this works, folks. Uh, first service, uh, you know, unfortunately, I have one of those deep voices that's hard for a lot of people to hear. Uh, in sharing with you folks, I actually arrived home, uh, uh, flew into Los Angeles uh, Friday, got in about uh, home about four o'clock in the afternoon, and then flew here Saturday, uh, and I'll be flying back right after the service today and in Mexico on Tuesday. Uh, uh, to give, I know that's been probably at least five years since we've been here, and a lot of you are probably new, so we want to give you a little bit of an understanding. Uh, we have been involved in the longest running civil war in Africa, the war in southern Sudan. In the last 64 to 65 years of the nation, We've had over 40 years of declared war, but folks, there's really been no time that we have not been fighting in the last 64 to 65 years of the nation, and we're fighting on multiple fronts now. It used to be we were fighting the Islamic government of the northern Sudan. Uh, I was talking to the, one of the generals in the intelligence, and he said, we're fighting five different armies, and there's 148 different rebel groups operating in the southern Sudan. Uh, not this summer, but the summer before last, it was upgraded to the third most dangerous nation in the world to live in. Uh, about 21 years ago, folks, uh, we began training chaplains for the South Sudan Army. And these are frontline combat chaplains. All of my men are armed. All of us go into battle. And I know that seems a little strange right now, but as we get in the message, I think you'll have a little bit of a better understanding of what we're talking about here. Uh, we have a very intense Bible school. We get the guys up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We run them nine miles. Then we have eight hours of class time and two and a half hours of study time daily. We only give them two meals a day. And the reason we do that is because we can't afford to feed them better, we can. But if we do not train them hard, they will not survive. Uh, once they graduate, they're deployed to forward operation units and the Southern Sudanese Army where we go into heavy combat conditions. Uh, none of these guys sit behind desks, they're frontline combat chaplains. And we're going to give you a little bit of understanding, show you a couple of photos here if they could bring the first one up. 
This is the front of our base in the southern Sudan. Now, folks, you're seeing a very small section of it. Uh, we can sleep over 700 people on this compound, so it gives you a little bit of an understanding there. Uh, next one. Just a different part of the base. And as you notice, we have kind of like a Jerusalem cross or what they would call a Crusader's cross. There's a reason why we do that. Uh, these walls are actually designed to stop 50 caliber machine gun bullets. And if you're not familiar with how powerful that is, one bullet could just about cut a man in half. But we're in a very radical part of the world. Uh, the reason we've designed it like this is there are no jobs in the southern Sudan. Probably a 3% unemployment other than the military. And because of that, you know, we keep having rebel groups propping up all over the world. We're trying to build it uh, to bring tourists into the area. Uh, our village is fairly safe because we have a strong military presence there. But we're actually going to build uh, 10 castle towers across the city. On four sides of it, they will each have a mosaic in tile of a biblical scene. And we want to make it a witness to the nation and hopefully create thousands of jobs and try to turn this country around there. Next one. This is our church, uh, Calvary Chapel Cush in Nimli, uh, South Sudan. We have three services. These are just the adults. Uh, we have children's choir in the front. Uh, but the first was in English, the second is in Mahdi. The third is in, our second is in Arabic, third is in Mahdi. And we're starting a fourth, fourth service for Entrian believers that have fled their nation to come there. Next one. These are the children. We get about 12 to 1,800 children every Sunday. If it's rainy, we're going to get 1,200. If it's sunny out, we'll get about 1,800 kids. Next one. These are the chaplains in both dress uniforms and field operation uniforms. Next one. This is a completely different facility in northern Uganda. It's a school. Uh, 700 children will live and go there. We do not charge the children to go to school. And again, the high walls are to protect them from Islamic terrorism. We have armed guards on the walls. We'll put up thermal imaging cameras so that we can spot the enemy five miles out and intercept them before they get to the kids. Next one. This is the inside of the school. Now, folks, you're seeing a very small portion of this compound. It really is a lot larger. Uh, the building to your left is the dormitories. To the right is classrooms. Next one. These are our boys. As you can see, they're pretty big boys. We train them pretty hard. Next one. In the center on the uniform is the president of Southern Sudan, Sevakil. The man in the light blue jacket is the commanding general of the Southern Sudanese Army. I led him to Christ 21 years ago. He's one of my closest friends. Uh, I was actually the best man in his wedding. My wife was the maid of honor. And I was just at his house about two weeks ago, folks. And please pray for him. He will probably be the next president of the Southern Sudan. If that happens, he will declare the Southern Sudan most likely to be a Christian nation. There are no nations on the earth that declare themselves to be Christian nations that actually mean it. There's a lot that claim Islam and do mean it. But one of the things that we've talked about, folks, is that as the world, as persecution comes upon the church and the world and more and more people are having to flee or suffer death, we're hoping to open up the southern Sudan where thousands of people can flee and come there and find refuge and a safe haven in a Christian nation. So please, please keep that in prayer. In sharing with you this morning... <clears throat> We're going to be in Acts chapter 9. And folks, one of the things that I want to share with you is that as believers, I think that many of us come to what I would call a born-again Christian experience. We accept Christ, we become born again. But I believe that there was an experience that God expected the church to travel a different road. We travel the road of becoming born again. But there's another road that I think that God intended the church to travel, and I would call it the road to Damascus. When Saul was on the road to Damascus, he would have an encounter with Jesus Christ, and it would forever change his life. Now, if you know anything about Paul the Apostle, before he became Paul, he was a brilliant man. He had a teacher by the name of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel talked a lot about Paul. He said one of the hardest things he had for him was finding enough books for him to read. I think if we tested him today, he would probably test at a genius level. He's authored many of the books of the New Testament and I think that God used him because his intellect was so uh, just sharp that he would be able to rightly divide the word of God and put it down to pen the way the Lord intended for it to be. But see, one of the things about Paul, he was a very zealous man for the gospel. Uh, he was actually on the road to Damascus he had given the approval of Christians being killed. He thought that Christianity was a cult. He wanted to wipe it out. 
He was on the road to Damascus, but folks, he had an encounter with Christ on that road. And once that happened, it forever changed his life. He was never, ever the same man again. I think that Paul probably had great aspirations. I think that he probably wanted to rise as high in the pharisaical order and the religious order of that day as he possibly could. Now, he could have not been the high priest because he was not of the Levitical tribe. But as high as Paul could go, I think Paul intended to climb that ladder. But again, once he met Jesus Christ, whatever his life was before, whatever his dreams were, whatever his ambitions were, it all ended at that one moment in time. And one of the things that I really believe is that the church is very ineffective today for the gospel. And it's because we're not lost in Christ. We're lost in the world. We have not learned what it means to be completely sold out for the gospel. One of the things in Africa is I do not train my men to be successful in ministry. I train them to die so that others might live, that others might know the great hope of the gospel. And I want to start by reading you a portion about Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house, he entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Well, folks, many people believe this is where Paul the Apostle started his public ministry, but that's not what happened at all. For the next 13 to 14 years, Paul the Apostle disappears. We really do not know much about his life during this time. The scripture is strangely silent on this subject. We know for a time that he was in Arabia, but beyond that, we know almost nothing about his life. But what was ever happening, God was putting tremendously deep roots into his life. When he starts his public ministry, he will only have 22 years of ministry before he'll be killed for his faith. 11 years in, he writes the second book of Corinthians, and he talks about the suffering that he went through in the first 11 years. And he says, five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, in danger from Jews, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger from false brothers, in danger from bandits. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides all these other things, I face daily my pressure and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. The reason the Jews would give 40 lashes minus one, meaning 39 lashes, is they used a whip called the cat nine tails. It had a long rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather that hung down from it. Within the leather, there's pieces of shell, pieces of bone, and pieces of metal. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of your body. The reason they gave 39 lashes is most men died at 40. They literally learned to beat a person within an inch of their life. Now, not everybody made it to 39, folks, but as a general rule, at 39 you would survive, and at 40 you would die. Early historians describe it as being a massacre, and they said that when people would go through these beatings, even if they survived, it, often they would go mad. They would never be mentally sound again in their life. It was a very severe beating. At about the time that Paul would heal from one, he would go through another very severe beating. And yet one of the things that Paul says of his life, 
I count my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race which God has set before me. See, Paul was a man that was lost in Christ, folks. He was not here to represent himself or his ministry or to build his kingdom. We have so many pastors today out there that want to write their book. And folks, I'm not saying there's not validity in some of it, but everybody wants to write a book today. Everybody wants to get their word out. See, we have a problem because we're here to preach the word of Christ to a lost world. You know, I've actually shared with the first service that I've had a lot of people try to get me to write a book. And folks, if the Lord ever tells me to do it, I will do it. But see, one of the things that I feel like, and I really believe this, is I feel like that we have the only book that we need here. And this is the one that brings life to a lost world. We're here to preach the gospel to people. I want to share with you a little bit about my own road to Damascus experience. It did not come when I first became born again. I had actually lied about my age when I was in the 10th grade and joined the United States Marine Corps. I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam, and folks, I was a pretty highly trained soldier. I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion. I trained at the Navy SEAL base, the Army Ranger base. We had our own specialized training, and I was a professional shooter for the Marines. I was what was called a PMI, a primary marksmanship instructor. And I competed in the Marine Corps Shot Battalion in division matches. My coach actually said to me, he goes, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think that you can shoot the Olympics. Well, I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people. So I had never any interest in going down that road there. But I remember that we mounted up and we started to go into Vietnam. And then President Ford called the war off and we all came back home. When I realized the war was over and I didn't get there, I decided to get out of the Marine Corps and go to Rhodesia and become a soldier of fortune. Fortunately, Christ would get a hold of my life and it would literally change everything about me, folks. I remember that many years after I got saved, my mother uh, talked to me and uh, I'm the oldest of five in my family. I have uh, three younger brothers and my sister is the youngest of the five of us. And my brother that followed me, Rick, was also, he's a missionary today, but he was in the Marines, he was in Special Forces, spent 20 years as a Houston police officer, and now he works in Cambodia. But Rick had told my mother many years later, he said, you know, Mom, when Wes left to join the Marine Corps, he goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He was the meanest man I have ever met in my life. He goes, when he would fight people, he wouldn't just fight them, he would purposely injure them. And folks, I don't know that it was, I was trying to be so evil, but... I grew up in a lot of rough places where there were a lot of gangs, and it was never one against one, it was ten against one. And so, as a young boy, I got myself a German Mauser pistol, a gun. I had a switchblade that was about this long, it looked like a machete when I opened it. I loved it because when I clicked the button, it would clack and it would scare people to death, you know. And, uh, and, and when I got into a fight, I would really beat people seriously. And really what I was trying to do was send a message which was, leave me alone. I just wanted to be left alone. But the other side of my personality of a handicapped kid was picking, getting picked on, I would always go to his rescue. I was just lost. But when I came to Christ, it literally changed everything about my life. And my brother said, you know, Mom, when Wes became a believer, he said he changed so much that I did not want him to ever leave again. When I became born again, I started reading the Word sometimes as much as nine hours a day. Probably two to three is a regular, but sometimes up as much as nine hours a day. But the first book that I read after the Bible was a book called Tortured for Christ, written by Richard Wombrandt. Richard Wombrandt was a Romanian pastor that spent 14 years in prison and was tortured for his faith very extensively. Now, the Romanian government could have easily killed him. But see, he was a leader in the church in Romania. And they knew if they killed him, they would make him a martyr and it would inspire people. So they, for 14 years, they tried to break his faith. I remember that when I got out of the Marine Corps, he was speaking in a large church in Southern California. It was not a Calvary Chapel, but it was an outstanding church. And the pastor of that church is one of the foremost theologians of our generation today. He's a phenomenal teacher. Probably 15 to 20,000 people attended this church, folks. And I remember that when Reverend Walbrandt walked into the sanctuary, he walked in wearing his socks. And the reason he did that was because when he was in prison, they would try to get him to deny his faith. He would refuse to do it, so they would lay him across the table, take his shoes and socks off, and break all the bones in his feet. They did this on multiple occasions. His feet were so damaged, it was very difficult for him to wear shoes. And I actually saw him about a year and a half before he went home to be with the Lord. It was very inspiring, but you know, I went to his house to meet 
date with him, and he was still walking around in his shoes and uh, socks and stuff. But I remember that when Reverend Wombrat got up on the stage, he told some of the most incredible stories of persecution that I have ever heard in my life. I have a good friend of mine who's actually a Calvary Chapel pastor, and he worked for Richard Wombrat for a number of years. And he said that one time they were going to speak in a church and they got caught in a rainstorm. He said, Wes, we got in there, but we were completely soaked. But fortunately, we had our luggage. And the pastor said, Reverend Wombrat, quickly go into my office and change. You're going to be on stage in about five minutes. He said, when Richard Wombrat took his shirt off, the first thing I saw was all the places that his body had been burned, all the places that he'd been beaten so badly that the color never returned to its natural color. He said he had three cuts that ran from the top of his shoulder all the way down across his stomach, all the way down. And he said, but the things that I noticed the most, he goes, there was a round circle, maybe the size of a half a dollar, that was down on the right-hand corner of his stomach, and it was black. It was also on the back of his back. And I looked at him and I said, Papa, what happened to you? He said, there was a time that they tried to get me to deny my faith and I refused to do it. So they took an iron poker and they heated it in the fire until it turned orange. And then they pushed it all the way through my body, but I refused to deny my faith. When he got done that day, folks, I said to myself, I am going to be the last person to leave this place. I don't care if it takes two or three hours. I need to understand this man's faith. But something would happen that day that would shock me more than anything that Reverend Wombrandt said. When the service was over, within about 10 minutes, the entire sanctuary was empty. Now, there were three or three or four doors on each side and four doors at the back. But I watched thousands of people walk past that man and said, thank you. We'll pray for you. Not one of them did thank him and pray for him. Not one of them gave him a gift for his ministry. And I said to myself, did these people not hear what I just heard? I know their pastor. They are well taught in the word of God. The Bible says to whom much has been given, much shall be required. I didn't understand how they could get up and leave. So I walked up to Reverend Wombrat and I said, Reverend Wombrat, I don't know how to help, but I would at least like to write a check. I said, who do I write the check to? And he said, Wes, write the check to Jesus. So I got out my checkbook and I wrote out a check for $180. Now folks, it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it was probably all the money I had in my life at that time. When I gave the check to him, uh, his wife Sabina came up to me and said, my husband spent many years in prison. But I also spent many years in prison. She goes, it was a very dark time in the history of Romania. If you were considered a threat to the state, there was no trial. All it took was for an officer to write an order, and they would take you out at midnight and shoot you in a firing squad. She said, we had a young 17-year-old girl that they had determined was a threat to the state, and she was going to be shot that night. She goes, there was a great gloom within the cell. She goes, all of us were depressed. We could not understand what this young girl had done. But she said, all of a sudden the young girl spoke up and she said, me and my fiance had hoped to glorify Christ in this life by being missionaries. But that is not how I should glorify him. Tonight, I will glorify him with my death. She said the girl's faith was so dynamic, it was like a light entered into the cell and raised the spirits of all the women. They said when the guards came to take her away, it was a very radical scene because there's these two huge bull of men, there's this tiny petite little girl, and they're marching her off to shoot her. And as they're marching her away to shoot her, they can hear this young girl talking to these two men. And she says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in him shall never die. And they shot that young girl that night. And guys, it would forever change my life. I would never be the same again. And I'm going to come back to this a while. I actually told the first service and then I got sidetracked and I didn't. But I'm going to come back to this a moment and explain to you why it really affected me. When I went to Africa, I did not go there to be a soldier. I'm ordained as a Calvary Chapel pastor. And guys, the Bible says it's the love of God that compels people to repentance. We're not there to reflect ourselves. We're there to reflect Christ to a lost world. We are to let them see Jesus Christ through our own lives. And I went there to lead people to Jesus Christ, to be a pastor, a Bible teacher, an evangelist. My main gift at that point in my life was the gift of evangelism. My wife, Vicki, was going to do the women and children's ministry. But what began to happen was rebels began coming around and attacking the villages around us. One village they hit, they took 58 children and they crushed their heads against trees. 
they would come in and rape all of the women from the age of nine years old to 90 years of age. The most beautiful of them, they would take into sexual slavery afterwards. Some of these rebel leaders had as many as 70 women, other men's wives, their daughters, orphan women were abducted and made to be the sexual slaves of these rebel leaders. They had no control over their bodies whatsoever. But the women that they didn't want, they would almost always just shoot them and kill them. But if they didn't shoot them and kill them, they'd cut their noses off, their lips, their ears, their breasts, their fingers. They wanted to bring great terror to the people, and they were extremely effective about doing that. And the Lord told me, you have got to do something about this. So we began to build sanctuaries for the women and children to come in at night. When the sun would begin to set, at first you would just see a trickle of women and children coming in. But by the time the sun went down, they were coming in by the thousands. They estimated in northern Uganda over 44,000 women and children a night were coming in looking for protection against the rebels. Under every tree, under every veranda, they were trying to escape the elements, the weather, and they were trying to escape rebel attack. Among the South Sudan army, there are great warriors, and they're extremely tenacious in battle, but often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win a battle, and then they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages they pulled out of, me and my men went into right afterwards. The Islamic army came in, they built these huge bonfires, and they picked up all the babies and toddlers and threw them in and burned them alive. And when we got there, we could see the remains of the children in the fire. And the Lord told me, you have got to deal with this. So I sent the men down. I said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, it is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We are men, they are women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of a man. We are called to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. We are called to care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. We know the tactic of the enemies. They don't hit hard targets. They don't come with 200 men and fight 200 men. They're cowards. They come with 200 men and they fight where there's five men. So if they come with 200 men one day and there's only five of us, just know this is the day you're gonna go home to meet the Lord. And you stand and you fight to the last man because in doing so, maybe another 10 or 20 women and children will escape. Guys, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that's truly terrified before, but probably the most vivid image in my mind was of a little girl. Her mother was killed in a rebel attack. I think she was probably two and a half to three years of age when we found her. And when we found her, she was holding onto the body of her dead mother. And I remember walking over and I picked her up and I put her in my wife Vicky's lap. And every part of her body is trembling. Her arms, her chest, her stomach, her thighs, her calves. And the heart that we have for these children is to be able to say to them, honey, you lay your head down tonight and you sleep and you dream the dreams that a child is supposed to dream. Nobody's gonna hurt you tonight, not on my watch. Tonight the body of Christ is gonna wrap its arms around you and we are going to protect those that cannot protect themselves. See, one of the little things that that little girl understands that many of us do not is that in Southern Sudan and Northern Uganda, Monsters are real, and they come to kill. You know, folks, when you're a soldier, you really do read Scripture in a different light. And I have respect for all men that serve, no matter what the branch there is. I have two former Navy SEALs that helped me in the ministry, Marine Raiders, Army Special Forces, all groups of guys that are coming along to be a part. See, we're not divided by which branch we serve with. We're soldiers in the army of God, and we have one singular purpose, to win a nation and a continent to Christ. But when men go into special forces, there are normally guys that they get in there by their natural ability. They're just so strong and physically agile. Some guys get in like that. But guys, most people who join special forces, what a lot of us do not understand is because they're geared that way. They're geared to protect. God made them to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. And this is the way that we are supposed to be as men. About maybe four years ago, I don't know exactly now, we had a rebel group that was probing our village. And uh, there were over, uh, we think, estimated between 1,000 and 1,200 gorillas. Our scouts had spotted them, but they were elusive. Every time we spotted them, they'd fade back into the bush. And they were coming for the women and children of our village. And I had to deploy the chaplains every single night into the field. We'd go out about seven o'clock 
and we weren't coming until four or five until we knew that they were not coming. And my standing order was intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let a single one of them get away. Now, guys, if they surrender, will I take them prisoner? Of course I will. But see, if I let them get away, they're going to come back for the women and children. And a lot of people don't understand this. We have Christians today that will come up to me and say, well, Wes, what about that scripture that says, turn the other cheek? Well, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It never meant to let them rape your wife and your daughter, to sell them into sexual slavery, to be able to murder and burn children alive and torture them. I don't know why the church doesn't understand that. We have a God-given right as men to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. I think about King David, you know, that he wanted to build a temple of the Lord, and God said to him, he goes, David, it's good that it's in your heart to do this, but you're a man of war, you're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. One of the things that we see today, folks, is we're raising a generation of effeminate men in America today. And our country is pushing this. It's really very sad what we're seeing here. I heard the president just came out the other day and said there's no longer any genders, that if a little boy says he's a woman and he wants to go in a little girl's bathroom, he can do it, or he can go into the soccer team. Well, let me tell you, Mr. President, I know my gender. I've never looked at a guy in my life and thought, wow, that's a good looking guy. It's never happened, it's never gonna happen, okay? We are living in a generation that doesn't understand what, it, what we're supposed to be like anymore. I remember I was getting on an airplane in uh, Fort Lauderdale a number of years ago, and this NFL star gets on the, on the airplane. Now, guys, I don't know who he is. I don't have time to follow this stuff, but everybody else on the airplane knows who this guy is. And as he gets on the airplane, I notice he's got a Louis Vuitton over his shoulder, and I look at the guy, and I go, wait a minute. I go, isn't that a purse? He goes, no, it's a bag. I said, well, my sister has the same one, and she calls it a purse, you know. So... You see, we have men today, they're so into fashion. Why was that ever supposed to be important to us, guys? See, I have nothing wrong with someone being dressed appropriately, but why was fashion ever supposed to be important to men? See, what was supposed to be important to men is we were supposed to be a wall between our families and the world. We were supposed to be the protector, the provider, the spiritual leader. I get guys out there, they lost their job and they act like little girls. And I say, if you don't have a job and you have a family to provide, I don't care if you have to take two low-paying jobs to take care of your family. That's what you do. You rise to the occasion, you know. This is the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to live lives that are above reproach. And you folks, I think about it in my own personal life. If I were to build a try to build a temple of the Lord, I suspect the Lord would send a prophet to me and say, Wes, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. But the great thing is, guys, is I can build his church. And I'd much rather build the church of the Lord than build the temple of the Lord. I want to come back to this young girl now, guys, that explained to you why it's so heavily affected me and continues over all these years. See, she was 17 years old. She's actually leaving becoming a young girl to becoming a young woman. And guys, while I'm a soldier, I'm not unaware of how young women view marriage. Most of them dream about it their whole life. They look forward to the day that they will wear the dress and the veil, the ceremony, the exchanging of the vows that they will have with their husband, the intimacy they will share with the children that will be born, and the life and ministry that she could have had. And all it would have taken for that young girl to have that was to say, I deny Christ. But she chose to die. I said, Lord, I'm a man of war. I'm a man of blood. I function quite well in a war zone, folks. I've actually heard generals of the South Sudan Army talk about me. I've overheard their conversations. Because people will ask, I'm the only white guy out there, and they'll say, who is this white man? And they go, you don't understand. He's a very serious soldier. He knows exactly what he's doing in combat, and I do. But she was a child. And if a young girl of 17 years old could give so much for Jesus Christ, how much more should my life count for the gospel? One of the things I want to ask you as believers, have you ever done anything that has ever cost you for the gospel? Have you ever made a donation to your church that you actually felt? Now, folks, you tithe, and I think that's wonderful. But have you ever given a gift here that you actually, it cost you to do it? Have you ever shared your faith when you weren't sure if it was safe? Have you ever done a ministry that you did not want to do? like children's ministry. You know, I, I get a lot of people, what kind of ministry? I do music, and I think that's great. But do you love music? Yes, I love music. But have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do? 
I remember about 30 years ago, I was going to Horizon School of Evangelism. And Mike McIntosh came out on stage one night and he said, hey, one of the ladies didn't show up for the children's ministry. We need a volunteer. Well, folks, I had no intention of volunteering at all. There were dozens of hundreds of women in that sanctuary. So he asked for a volunteer. Not a single one of them raised their hand. They knew something I didn't. So finally, using a great lack of discernment, I raised my hand. I got the four-year-olds. I would rather be back in Sudan being shot at than ever go through that experience again. If I ever do children's ministry again, I'm taking a gun with me. I think it's only fair. But have you ever done anything that you did not want to do? And one of these we have to ask ourselves because King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. Folks, persecution is coming to this nation. And it may come very, very rapidly. And we're going to see, the Bible says there's going to be a very big thinning out of the church. A lot of people say 50% of the church will disappear. Well, 50% of it disappeared under COVID. I think it's going to be a lot greater than that. And if you are not completely committed to the gospel, you're not going to make it. See, one thing as believers, we want to represent a sports team, a motorcycle, have the motorcycle brand we love across our shirt, a rock group or a movie star. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of people are timid about their faith. They don't want to share it. But Jesus said, if you deny me before man, I will deny you before the Father who's in heaven. But if you confess me before man, I will confess you before the Father's in heaven. I want to talk to you about one of our chaplains in the last three weeks of his life. And guys, you're going to see him on a video in a moment here. His name is Peter Guy. You'll recognize him because he's got a large gap between his two upper front teeth. I do not know why, but in East Africa, Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, those places like that, if you have a large gap between your two upper front teeth, you're considered a very good looking man or a very good looking woman. I, I don't know why, just part of the culture over there. Beauty in Africa is extremely different. If you're thin, they don't think you're very good looking over there. If you're overweight, they think you look fantastic over there. I told my wife, Vicky, I said, honey, you got to be careful. I said, I'm like the Fabio of our village out here. This is very different over there, you know. But I remember that we got a message from the front that Peter Guy had been killed in May of 2014. Folks, we actually lost three chaplains that day, but we didn't know it for a while. What happened was the enemy launched a sneak surprise attack. They came down with 7,000 soldiers. Peter's unit was the first one scrambled and sent to attack while other units were being assembled. But they only had 700 men. They hit the enemy unit head on. We fought three major battles. 300 men were killed. There were 400 left. There was an ominous feeling among all the 400 men that everybody was going to die. And the ominous feeling was correct. Every single person was going to die. The only reason we know what happened is we had a fourth chaplain whose name was also Peter. And he was sent out as a runner a couple days before the final battle. And he told us about the last three weeks of Peter's life. He said, Wes, Peter was really suffering in the final days of his life. He said, a month before he was killed, his wife left him for another man. And she said to him, I don't want to be married to a pastor. I don't want to be in the ministry. I want a better life. Guys, there is no better life over there. It was just lust for another guy. But Peter was really suffering through it. He goes, but the men in our unit did not know it. Peter would not tell them. He goes, I would watch him. He would go out. He would sit down with 20 soldiers. He'd open up the word of God. And 30 minutes later, all their heads would go down and lead him to Christ. And then there'd be 10 and 15 and five and another 20. And when he was absolutely exhausted, he would come back and suffer in silence with us. And he'd say, I don't know why she left. I loved her. I, I don't know what I did wrong. Then he'd get a strength back and he'd go out and share again. A week before he was killed, his sister called him and said, Peter, your wife has left you. You need to live in the military, come home and take care of your family. And Peter responded and said, first of all, I am a soldier within the Southern Sudanese army. If I were to leave, that is desertion, which is punishable by firing squad. But far beyond that, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go. He goes, I was chosen by God to be here at this place and time, and I will not leave my post. We were in communication with them just before the last battle, and the last transmission was sent. They said, we see a large army arrayed against us. We will call you after this battle. Call never came. All 400 men were killed. 
We have never recovered the body of our, our other two chaplains. They lie among some 700 men whose bodies who are no longer distinguishable by the ravages of war. But folks, I have often thought about when Peter crossed over. See, Peter didn't just cross over by himself. He crossed over with 400 men that he led to Jesus Christ. Whatever the heartache, whatever the betrayal, whatever the sorrow he felt at the end of his life, he is a prince in the kingdom of God, and his reward is going to be great. I think of the story of the ten minas. It says that God gives a mina to three different men. One goes out and bears ten, one goes out and bears five, one goes out and bears in the ground. To the one that bears ten, he says, you're going to be in charge of ten cities. To the one that's charged five, he says, you're going to be in charge of five cities. To the one that buried it in the ground, he says, take it away and give it to the one that has 10. They said, but sir, he already has 10. He goes, I tell you that to everyone who's been given, more will be added. But for the one that has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. And what this scripture is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for the kingdom of God. Now, it's strange to think that if we win 10 people to Christ in this life, there is a possibility that we'll be over 10 cities in the kingdom of God. I actually was talking to David Guzak a while back. We were both teaching at a conference. And David's a big theologian. And I asked him about this scripture because I've studied it quite extensively, folks. I said, David, do you believe that we'll actually rule over cities in the kingdom of God? He said, you know, Wes, there's a lot of theologians that believe that. Much like the British Empire when they would have a viceroy over India, Kenya, Uganda, or the Sudan, will be viceroys over cities in the kingdom of God. Is Peter over 400 cities? I don't know. But what I do know is the Bible says, the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, the mind cannot conceive the things that God has prepared for those that love him. We do not have the ability to understand, folks, what the treasures of heaven are like. They're too far beyond us. You know, the Bible says that when we go to heaven, God is going to wash away every sorrow and every tear. And people will say, well, that's for the loves of ones that didn't get saved. I don't think it's what it is at all. I think it's when we see the lives that we could have had and we chose not to have. That's when we're going to have to wash away the sorrows and tears. Realizing that our lives could have been so much more for Jesus Christ. Folks, we're going to show you a DVD here in a moment. And as we show it to you, the first part is about the Syrian church. Now, we have a division of our ministry. We're actually operating in 28 countries around the world. We are in seven of the 10 most dangerous Islamic countries. We have operatives in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan under the Taliban. We're in Iraq and Syria under ISIS and Al-Qaeda. There is a Hamas, Hezbollah, and a lot of these other radical Islamic groups. We have fully supported 400 pastors on the ground there. Our goal is to have 700 people in the underground there. When you hear the Syrian church, the testimony is very difficult to hear, but is also very inspiring. Afterwards, you will see all the chaplains that have been killed in our ministry, and remember Peter Guy because of the gap between his teeth. Let's go ahead and show that, guys. When the war start, many problems happen, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some some day uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, at that time, I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together. And I said, as in Acts book, the believers when they have the persecuted most of them they go out of Jerusalem. If you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lose our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after time, I turned back to see the decision of the leaders. I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave. We will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do? 
if this happened. For that, we buy this land and we built a graveyard. This graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it first uh, happened in Raqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be, uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian. They put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, was his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they asked the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son in front of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between this uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, so, sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important thing for, uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life and when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this. Don't 
travel me in my father's arms on me the wounds this world left on my soul i'll be healed and i'll be whole sun and moon will be replaced with the light of jesus face And I will not be ashamed For my Savior knows my name It don't matter where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face. I'll be home and I'll be free. The number has risen, folks. We now have lost 67 men in the service of Jesus Christ. And we're going to lose a lot more before this is over with. But again, we do not teach them to be successful in ministry. We teach them to die that others might live, that others might know the great hope and the great love of Jesus Christ. We have this thought in our mind that there is a, a, a bottom that the enemy hits. Satan can go down so far, and there just there isn't any more depth. You can't get any more perverse. Over my many years in the southern Sudan, I have learned there is no truth in that whatsoever, folks. We begin to have rebels coming in our area and capturing families, and African families can be quite large. Four, five, six, seven kids is common. 11, 12, 13 is not uncommon. And what they started doing is normally pulling out a little girl of about nine or 10 years of age, and they would give her a machete and say, cut the head off your mother. And if the child refused to do it, they'd say, if you do not cut the head off your mother, we will cut the head off your father, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters, and we'll kill you. And mothers would beg their children to kill them. I have counseled many of these children, and there is literally no English ability to explain that to you. We just don't have words for it. I know that a lot of what I say is very shocking to the body of Christ, and I've shared with the body of believers that I've never had a problem with having to take human life. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. I do not enjoy killing. I never have and I never will. But when men come to rape women, cut them to pieces, burn children alive, sell people into sexual slavery, we're going to do exactly what it takes to stop them. And we are not apologetic about it at all. We have a God-given right to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. I do a lot of study of history. I have five libraries. And folks, I want to share with you that uh, I do a lot of reading of secular history. Right now I'm reading a book on the legions of Rome, one on Genghis Khan, one on Stalingrad, and one on the Knight Templars. And it's interesting because in the legions of Rome, all it is about is the Roman legions. It has nothing to do, it's not written by Christians, but they give a full account of Paul the Apostle in there that's more detailed that's in the Bible. It's got every detail the Bible has, but it even has more on top. It's incredible to read. See, there's great history and great evidence for the gospel. But I was reading about the Knight Templars, and, you know, when I share about the Knight Templars, folks, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, well, Wes, are you supporting the Catholic Church? I said, well, guys, first of all, a thousand years ago, the Catholic Church was the church. And the bottom line, folks, whether you like this or not, the church has always been the church. In every, almost every denomination, you'll find true believers and false believers. Many people just have bad doctrine. That's all there is to it. They've been raised wrong. When I first got to Sudan, and I went there in 96, so it's been 25, 26 years, uh, I met a Catholic priest over there. Been there 30 years, an Italian man. Now, guys, I don't agree with his doctrine, 
But there was no doubt in my mind that that man loved Christ, and to the best of his ability, he was trying to share the Lord. I have met Calvary Chapel pastors that have committed adultery, that have slept with other men's wives, that have stolen from the church, that have lied. I even know one that got a woman pregnant and he killed her and buried her so that he wouldn't be found out with his unborn child. He's in prison right now, which is exactly where he should be. See, the Bible says a tree is known by its fruit. A good tree will bear good fruit. As men of God, we are to live above reproach. You know, one of my staff members said to me one time, you know, guys, over the years of working, and we built nine Calvary chapels in Russia. It's just one of the countries we're working in. I probably have at least somewhere between nine and 10 young ladies over there between the age of about 19 and 30 that have adopted me as a second father. Now, I didn't seek them out. They kind of sought me out, and I became like a father figure to them. But one of my staff members said to me, he goes, you know, Wes, I noticed that young women always feel safe around you. I said, that's because I look at them from the neck up and not the neck down. I said, most Christian men don't realize this, but when they look at a girl, they'll give her the once over. They don't even realize they're doing it. But it tells them something about your character. We are to live above reproach. And if you're going to be a pastor or in the ministry, unless you can live by the standard, you have no business being in the ministry at all. But when you became a Knight Templar, you chose a life of celibacy. You were never to marry. You were never to own any material possession. All that you owned was the white shield with the red cross, the white robe with the red cross. You had your armor and you had your weapons. And Knight Templars were supposed to protect people as they made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. A thousand years ago, the Arabs were attacking Christian caravans, taking their women, raping them, killing the husbands, selling them as slaves, their children as slaves. And in Islam, they teach that it's okay to make women prostitution, prostitutes. Wonderful religion. They try to make Islam sound like it's a peaceable religion. It is not at all. They do not teach love your neighbor, love your brother. They teach world domination at the expense of whatever life should be taken. So they were out there and they were protecting the women and children. Now you have to remember, guys, they didn't have the Bible to read. All they had was what the Pope and the priest told them. So to the best of their ability, they're trying to follow Christ. When Saladin was marching with his army to retake Israel, 140 knights found out he was coming, and they set out to intercept him. But Saladin was not alone. He was with 7,000 Saracen soldiers. And one day's march behind him was over 100,000 men that were following. Some of the knights wanted to turn and leave and run, but there was a knight by the name of Gerard, and Gerard said, Listen, men, we have been sworn to serve. We have been sworn to protect. And whether we live or we die, we will be with Christ. And 140 knights attacked 7,000 Saracen soldiers. They were utterly destroyed. The last one to fall was a man by the name of James of Malise. And when all the other knights had been killed, he mounted his horse and he charged 1,000 Saracens. They were so taken by his bravery, they begged him to surrender. They said, we will not enslave you, we will not hurt you, we will not torture you, we will let you go, but just stop. But he was sworn to protect, so he fought until they killed him. They thought that they had killed a Christian saint. They had never seen this before, this kind of bravery, this kind of devotion. The interesting thing about this story, folks, is this is not a part of Christian history. This is a part of Islamic history. All the Christians were dead. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see the Heavenly Father. We are to live lives above reproach. Folks, I do not know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will tell you what the greatest desire of my life is. And when I share this with you, I'm not sharing it. I, wouldn't, I want no praise or accolades at all. They mean nothing to me. Call it a premonition. I've always felt that I will not live out my natural life. At some point, I have a feeling I'm going to be killed in the southern Sudan. And when that day comes and I stand before a holy God and I look into his eyes for the first time, I want to hear him say, well done, son. Well done. My prayer for you as a group of believers is that you will leave here today choosing to be defined by something more than what you have been that you will count the cost of falling Christ, that you'll go home and actually think and say, Lord, here am I, send me. 
Not that you would go to the mission field, but that you will do whatever Christ tells you to do. That you will choose a life set aside, that you will choose holiness. In closing this morning, we're gonna give you a couple opportunities here, folks, and I wanna to talk to you about this for just a moment. I, I tell people all the time, people say, well, how do you know God's will? I say, guys, 98% of knowing God's will is common sense. It's written in the word of God. Care for the poor, care for the hungry, visit those in prison. It's, it's very clear to reach out to the lost, to love, to show compassion to those who are in suffering, to care for people. I, I, I find people, they go on these spiritual quests, they go off into the desert for 40 days or they go to a cave somewhere in Israel and they come back and they feel empty. They didn't find what they were looking for. Well, if you would just do what you're, the Bible tells you to do, the quest would probably not be necessary. And I'm not saying that it isn't good to take times. I've fasted once in my life for 40 days. But I think there are times that God calls people to that. But as a general rule, if you'll just do what the Lord says, 98% of it is there. There is the mystical, the 2%, where God's leading you to maybe a new country or a new work and you have to pray that through. But 98% of everything else is written right there in the Word of God. You know, just before I left for the South Sudan this last time, uh, we have a missionary lady by the name of Bikta. And she's a wonderful woman, one of the most fireballs for Christ I've ever seen. And uh, she called me on the phone. She said, Wes, there was uh, three children running around the neighborhood. One was two, one was four, and one was six. And they were running around, and people said, where's your mother? They said, well, Mom came and told us she was leaving and not coming back. She just left them. And I said, Big, to find a family to take care of them until I can resolve what to do with these children. I said, I'll pay them, but let's just find someone to take care of them. And then she called me back two days later and said the mother had returned and wanted to take the children and sell them to the cartel. Because what they do is they put the children on the road begging 12 hours a day. They keep all the money. And then when the little girls turn 9 to 10, they put them into prostitution. Now, guys, I didn't need to pray about it. I didn't need to fast. I didn't need to go on a spiritual quest to figure out what I was supposed to do. I said, big time on my way. I got in my car, drove down there immediately. We went and got the children back. We found the grandmother, and the grandmother was a good woman. She had three of the other children. And she said, I wanted to take care of the children. I love the children. But she was living off $25 a week. So we're building our house right now. We got the walls up. And we're feeding the family. We're taking care of them, and we're ministering the love of Christ to them. I didn't need to pray about it. When you know what the right thing to do, do it immediately, or you will compromise in your relationship with the Lord. We don't need to think about these things. When you know it's right, do it. But today, <clears throat> we want to give you an opportunity. And the first thing that I want to say, guys, if you want to do this, do not take it out of your church tithing. Folks, as a mission organization, we're not a small organization. We're a very large organization. Our U.S. headquarters is over 16,000 square feet. We are operating in 28, 29 countries right now. I kind of lose count. And uh, we're actually financially larger than most of the large Calvary chapels. I wouldn't say all of them, but probably most of them. The last three years in a row, we put about $7 million into the field every year. And we run our operations off of less than 10% of what we bring in. I'm not here because I need your money. The Bible said, not that we might receive, but that you might store your treasures in heaven. Well, today we brought the children that the mother wanted to sell. We need people to sponsor them. It's $50 a month to sponsor the child and you will get updates on them. This is to send them to school to feed them and to make sure that they're never sold. They'll be out there on the table if you'd like to do it. Then we have our pastors under, in the Middle East under ghost operations. We have 300 to go that need sponsorships. It's $75 a month to sponsor one of these. Now folks, I always tell people, if you can't afford this, you say, I'd like to do it, but I can't do 50 or 75, I can do 10. Great. That's fine, don't worry about it. But if you'd like to sponsor one of these, it's $75 a month. Now with this one, the children you will get updates on these, we can tell you nothing about them. We have absolute secrecy around them because if they are found out, they will be tortured and killed and raped. The only thing you'll ever know is if they're killed, that's all we can tell you. And then we have our chaplains in the South Sudan Army. Most of my guys speak between four and seven languages. Some of them speak 13. All of them are frontline combat chaplains. These are also 75. I do have Bictus photo out there and another uh, Calvary Chapel pastor that needs support. You'll see them also, and you can do whatever you want. If you would like to do this, do not take it out of your church tithing. If you cannot afford to do it as a gift above and beyond, please do not do it. Now, I always tell people, I say, you know, uh, 
There are people out there that ask me every Sunday, what if I want to do all three? We're not asking that. But I realize there are people out there that financially are doing well and they have means and they can support their church and give above and beyond. They say, how much for all three? It's $200 a month to do all three. And if you can do that, it's wonderful. We're not asking you to do it. It is an automatic debit. It comes out on the third of each month. You cannot do it on our website. We had to take everything off our website, folks. We found out Al-Qaeda was following our website. We had two of our missionaries that they had on Al-Qaeda kill sites. A kill site is where they put up a photo of you and say, kill on site. So we can't put that stuff out there. If you'd like to do it, you take this form, fill it out, name, address, phone number, sign it at the bottom. Voidy checks work best because we don't pay fees, but you can use debit or credit cards. And if you don't have your financial information, but you would like to do it, just give us your name, address, and phone number, and we'll call you later. In closing this morning, let me just close with this here. You know, I do a lot of traveling around the world and speaking to a lot of churches. And folks, I don't lack for churches. I'm booked all the way through the end of May right now. And I'm going to ask Ray to come up here in a moment and close. I could book out two years in advance, but I, I don't want to do that. But I remember I was talking to a pastor a number of years ago. The, the senior pastor of this church we've been very involved with, he died. The assistant pastor took over. And he called me up and wanted me to come out and speak. And I said, well, uh, I'm giving him the Sundays that I have. And he goes, oh, no, 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 Wes, I can't do that. I go, what do you mean? He goes, um, well, uh, it's too important for my people to hear me speak. I can't give up a Sunday. I said, brother, I have uh, heard you speak. And I can tell you that your people will be delighted to have someone else come in on a Sunday from time to time. <clears throat> I sometimes lack couth, you know, but uh, needless to say, I didn't go there and speak. <clears throat> and I'm good with it. But my point is, is that and this is what I want to drive home to you today because I want to make sure you don't miss this, folks. See, Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. Now, if you choose God, then it's up to you whether you serve or not. But if God chose you, that's a different story. I want to encourage you, you need to get out there and share your faith. I Watch the movie Gladiator, and I think many of you have probably seen the movie Gladiator. It's very close to true, real life. I've actually read the history on that. Not completely, but it's close. But in the movie Gladiator, when they first start the movie and Caesar and the General Maximus are going out to fight the Gauls, which were the Germans, they're going out to fight them, and they fight this major battle. And right after the battle's over, Caesar's son comes riding up with all of his robes on his horse, looking divine, and he jumps off and he says, have I missed it? Have I missed it? Have I missed the battle? And Caesar says to him, you missed the war. You missed everything. Guys, some of us are going to get to the other side and you're going to have missed the war. See, sharing your faith is not an option for the believer. I, 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 I'll ask people, I'll say, do you ever share your faith with anyone? They go, well, it's not my gift. I said, you know, it's interesting because the scripture says, go into the world and make disciples of all men unless it's not your gift. Only it doesn't say that, does it? See, guys, being good at something isn't a reason of why you do it. My son is not good at cleaning his room. I require him to do it. God requires us. And the truth of the matter, guys, if you love the Lord, you want to. Every year, I, I spoke at a Hawaii pastor's conference a few years ago, and every year they're talking about running the race, finishing well, not committing adultery, and I said, guys, every year we hear the guys come up and teach on this, and every year I find more Calvary Chapel pastors that have fallen into adultery. I said, the only thing that's going to keep you pure is if you love Christ more than yourself. If you love the Lord, you don't want to disappoint him. Guys, I personally probably led 300,000 people to Christ or more. Now, a lot of it's been large auditoriums with people. How many are true? I don't know. But see, that's not my job. My job is just to share the way. And what I want to encourage you, starting this next week, not, you don't do this once a lifetime or once a year. Every week, try to invite someone to church. And sometimes God will tell you to go through the whole gospel message and lead them to Christ. Other times, just invite them. Just say, you know what? Why don't you come to church on Sunday? I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. You know, guys, I tell people when I'm trying to get them to go to church, I say, you know, guys, I, I said 40 years ago, I said I was an extremely violent man. And someone invited me to Calvary Chapel and it, changed everything for me. Sometimes that's all they need to hear. Just say, I was lost and I went to Calvary and I was found. 
you don't even have to beat him up with the gospel. You let Pastor Ray beat him up with the gospel. You know, I told people once, and I actually heard this from your youth pastor here, and I thought, that's pretty much me, so I use it a lot. But I said, you know, I, I thought about being a pastor once, and I love Ray because he's got a pastor's heart, but I thought about being a pastor, but I realized you had to like people, and I thought, well, just not going to work for me, and I'd, I better be a foreign missionary. <clears throat> but guys, we're, we're running a race, and persecution is coming to America. Whether you like it or not, they're going to start restricting the church. In England, they're trying to pass a law right now that if you share with a homosexual, if he comes to you and says, hey, I'm struggling with homosexuality, I'm struggling, I feel like what I'm doing is wrong. If you tell them it's wrong, they want to put you in jail. That's happening in England right now. All across Europe, they're starting to make laws where you cannot share your faith. It's coming to America. But let me give you this encouragement. The Bible says, when you see all these things happening, look up to heaven and know that your redemption draweth nigh. This is the most exciting time that we could ever live in. The coming of the Messiah. Pastor Ray, God bless you.